make one. I could go print one out, but I'd have to go do that first. Mm -hmm. Upstairs. Mm -hmm. Sorry. But it should be pretty much the same, right? About the charter cable TV. Do we have that on the? Can yeah, I, just, I think. Can I, mean, I just it's a point to a schedule, to a so slide? Schedule, but um, this is fine, and I'll just write. It's Eric. I got Eric. Thanks for coming to my rescue. <coughs> I mean, it's we'll planning commission, not council. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I would what say. Is, <laughs> what, what one of these? One of you. Okay. We ready? Yes. <laughs> Wait. There we go. Got the gavel. <laughs> the gavel. Hello, and welcome to the Capitolist Planning Commission meeting of October 20th, 2022. In accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is open to the public in both in-person and remote attendance as possible. Uh, council, uh, <laughs> we're attending in person, um, and there are several ways for the public to join, either in person or to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting via Zoom uh, should be on, a, on the screen right now. And... Um, it's also available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and uh, on the meeting's published agenda. Uh, the public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website. And as always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8. It is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday the following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. And tonight, our technician is Eric Johansson. So thank you very much for that, Chloe. And with that, um, we'll begin the meeting with the roll call and Pledge of Allegiance. Can we start with the roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner Christensen. Here. Commissioner Newman. Here. Commissioner Ruth. Here. Commissioner Westman. Here. And Chair Wilk. Here Thank and now, uh, we'll, you can stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> all right, let's move on. To oral communications, are there any additions and deletions to agenda? I know there are. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Chair Wilk. Uh, for item 3B, for the conceptual review, we've received 10 additional uh, public comments. There's a copy of each at your seats, and um, those will be added to the agenda packet following the meeting. And we also wanted to change the order of um, the meeting and yes. go with oh so this is oh you did you did it you already changed it okay did we also change the uh can we also change b and c and do c and c b b before b is that what you wanted to do that would be great yeah. if you could do so that. the update is we we updated the agenda this this morning and the zoning code update which was the last item on the agenda will now be heard first the following two items will be heard after seven at 7 p.m we're going to first hear the Monarch Cove in zoning code amendment at the request of there we go. Commissioner Newman because he has to recuse himself. And then we'll, the last item on the agenda tonight will be the Bald Avenue conceptual review. So Capitola Road and Bald Avenue. Very good. Okay. Now is the time for item 2B, public comments. This is the time for any member of the public to chime in on items that are not on the agenda. You have three minutes. If there are any speakers or Zoom attendees who wish to speak on items not on the agenda, now's the time. Do we have any one wish to address the council, committee, anybody online? Tonight we have two attendees via Zoom and neither has their hand raised. Very good, let's then move on to commission comments. Do any of the commissioners have any comments? No. I do. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I just have one brief one. I would like to thank the city for putting on the fireworks show again this year. I think it's a really nice community event that takes place. Um, and I have a comment regarding the uh, Committee on the Environment, which had a meeting yesterday. 
And uh, we had an, uh, um, a representative from AMBAG, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, uh, give us a presentation on coordinating climate action plans. Now, and now we have a capital climate action plan uh, in place, I guess it's since like 2015. One of the things that they mentioned was, you know, basically co trying to coordinate efforts between the cities on environmental activity, specifically on reducing carbon emissions or CO2e equivalent <laughs> carbon emissions. And one of the things I thought was it might be interesting to this committee or commission would be uh, EV charging. So the biggest hitters on emissions are. Um, residential, primarily gas, you know, uh, natural gas, and transportation. And transportation, obviously, is CO2 emissions from tailpipes. And so the notion would be, is that there's something we could do, like I noticed in our uh, item today, we're gonna go over the code and it talks about parking lots. And if there's something we might wanna consider one day or the council might wanna consider one day of changing the code or creating some in incentives for um, EV charging stations, uh, that would go a long way to us meeting our future goals uh, on our uh, on our climate action plan. So I thought that was kind of interesting and something we ought to be aware of and maybe pursue in the future. Okay, staff comments. Item C. No staff comments this evening. All right, public hearings. Three A, uh, zoning code amendments. Staff presentation. This evening, we have Ben Noble of Ben Noble Planning to present the zoning code amendments for 2022. I just want to start by saying we had a comprehensive update to our zoning code last year, and since utilizing the new code, we found a few items that need to uh, be updated to be in sync. And then we also, of course, have our latest and greatest from the state regarding ADUs, so we want to bring it up to compliance as well with that. Um, and. Ben Noble is here tonight to present. Thank you, Ben. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you, Katie. So I will share my screen. And is that visible to you? Yes. Great. All right, so again, my name is Ben Noble. I am the consultant to the city assisting with these 2022 zoning code amendments. And I will um, give a brief presentation, uh, start with some background, and then um, go over some of the highlights of the amendment. So as Katie mentioned, uh, the city adopted a comprehensive zoning code update in 2020, and it was certified by the Coastal Commission in 2021. And uh, as we expect it, um, once the code was adopted, we discovered some things that need to be um, amended, some cleanup amendments to uh, correct some drafting error, errors, to remove some, resolve some ambiguities, to improve um, some organization, and then also to address some new issues that have come up since the code was uh, adopted two years ago. <coughs> so the amendments that are before the Planning Commission tonight affect a number of chapters. Uh, they're listed here on the screen, and included in the packet are only the chapters um, that would be affected by the Amendment. So if a chapter um, does not include any changes, uh, we did not include that chapter within uh, the packet tonight. Um, those chapters would remain uh, in the municipal code uh, unchanged. In the staff report, we identified uh, 10 topics of interest. Um, these are, these are uh, proposed amendments that we think are of particular interest to the Planning Commission or the general public. Uh, there's a brief discussion of these items in the staff report, and as part of this presentation, I'm going to briefly uh, describe each of these. And our recommendation for Planning Commission discussion tonight is um, to go through these 10 topics of interest and the amendments that are included in each of them um, and determine if the proposed amendments are acceptable or if any additional adjustments are needed, if there are any questions um, about them, and go through them one by one. Um, and then also, after we've done that, to see if there are other proposed amendments that planning commissioners wish to um, discuss tonight uh, and make any further uh, adjustments to what's proposed. So that's, that's our recommended process 
So I'll briefly go through these um, as part of the presentation and starting with large retail uses. And on each of these slides in the upper right, there's a reference to the page of the packet uh, where this proposed amendment can be found as well as the section number reference. So with large retail uses currently within the CC and the CR district, uh, retail is a P use, a permitted use, meaning that there's no requirement for a planning commission hearing with a CUP or a minor use permit approved by the, by the director. And also in the existing code, uh, grocery stores are not specifically included in the retail definition. Um, so the proposed amendment tonight uh, is to require a CUP in the CC and CR district for retail uses 20,000 square feet or more, and then also to uh, amend the retail land use category definition in the glossary to specifically include grocery stores. And the reason we propose this is because with larger retail establishments, such as a grocery store, uh, there could be circulation uh, impacts to surrounding uses or other aspects of the proposed use that, in our opinion, warrants um, discretionary review by the, by the Planning Commission. And that's the rationale uh, behind this proposal. The next proposed amendment of interest is cannabis retail signs. So in the existing code, there are uh, standards that are unique to signs um, advertising a cannabis business. And um, those standards limit the number of signs to one sign per business uh, and establish a maximum sign area that's no more than um, 15 square feet. Uh, and this is more restrictive than other retail or business establishments. So uh, the proposed amendments include uh, a few modifications to the existing cannabis retail sign standards. Um, it, um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, sign area and number, number of signs, the uh, standard that would apply to cannabis retail signs would be the same as for other business establishments. What that is in the CR and CC and I district is um, a maximum of one square feet uh, per linear foot or 50 square foot max. And that's total um, for all signs that might be advertising that corner. And in terms of number of signs, uh, the way the code currently works is that um, it's, a little bit of, it's a little bit variable and it's based on uh, the sign type that are uh, provide it for the business and generally um, one of each sign type is allowed per business so you could have for example one wall sign one monument sign um, one sign per awning and that's the way that the number of, um, of, si of allowed signs is regulated for uh, other types of businesses and what the proposed amendments would do is apply that same standard to cannabis business um, as it does to other types so, okay, so ben, the third topic of interest. Excuse me, yeah. Ben, are you asking for questions on each item as you go? Do we want us to hold our questions till the end? I would recommend holding the questions till the end. Okay. Okay, so third item is pergolas. Um, so within the code currently, uh, there's references to trellises, pergolas, and arbors. Um, the use of that terminology is not 100% consistent, um, and therefore the applicable standards that apply to those types of features is in places unclear. Uh, so the proposed amendments include um, new and revised definitions for pergolas, arbors, and trellises. And then there are some revised standards that apply to pergolas, uh, what the code proposed amendment says is that if a pergola is attached to a building wall, uh, it can project five feet into the front step back and four feet into the exterior side, side step back. Um, we're also proposing to prohibit freestanding pergolas in the front and exterior side step back areas and yards, and to exclude from the floor area calculation pergolas that are open on at least three sides. 
so in the in the glossary, um, there's some new and revised definitions here. A picture is definitely worth uh, a thousand words. This is what a pergola is. It can either be freestanding or it could be attached to a building. A trellis um, is sort of more of a two-dimensional two, two um, fence-like structure that can either be uh, attached to a building or freestanding. And an arbor is a freestanding sort of garden structure that you can either walk through or there could be a bench in there. So these are photographs that are illustrating the new and revised definition. And one thing that I wanted to point out is that um, the specific language in the packet relating to pergolas is um, uh, shown on the screen now. And we're actually recommending um, tonight a slight modification to the language that was in your packet. Uh, you can see here uh, in the table 1748.3 that identifies allowed encroachments into required setbacks. We have the trellis structure that was changed to pergola, um, and that was, I think, the relevant thing here. We, we want to make, or we are proposing um, an adjustment to that proposed language that's shown on the screen here. And um, I, I expect that during the Planning Commission's deliberation, you'll probably want to look at this a little bit closer. Uh, but just to give you a, a, a high level of what we're proposing here is um, to make it clear that if um, you have a freestanding um, uh, pergola, that it is not allowed in the front step back, and it's not allowed in the front yard. The, the area that's between the front of the home and the front property line. Um, but it is allowed in the rear setback in the rear yard and the interior side and the interior yard as long as it's 10 feet and it's three feet from the property line. Um, and then so we have um, some additional proposed language tonight that wasn't in your packet um, that uh, that makes it clear that an accessory structure, including a pergola, including a hot tub, uh, things like that, cannot be within that front or exterior side yard, um, even if it's outside of the setback area, as long as it's between the building and the property line, it's not allowed. And so we're, we're, that's the current interpretation, and we're clarifying that. Um, and then we're also proposing uh, amendments to the accessory structure language um, to make it clear that uh, uh, structures such as a garage, a shed, a hot tub, and a pergola are considered to be an accessory structure and subject to um, the standards that apply to such structures. And so I realize this is new, new material, um, and I expect that um, uh, we'll want to take a, a little more time looking at this more closely later. So thank you for that. Um, oh, and here's an image that's uh, illustrating what I just said. So um, a, a pergola or other accessory structure uh, would not be allowed in the front setback area. Um, but if the primary building of the home is set back from that front setback area, uh, a pergola or other accessory structure also would not be um, permitted to be located between the front property line and the building, even if it's outside of the required front. Okay, so moving on to accessory dwelling units. So uh, there are a number of proposed amendments to the ADU chapter, and most of them are proposed to uh, address recently adopted state law. Um, the legislature continues to tinker with ADU law on a, on a yearly basis, so uh, cities need to update their codes to be consistent. Um, so uh, I won't spend a lot of time going over those, but it addresses issues such as permitting <laughs> process, correction of violations, unpermitted ADUs, and these are all things that uh, the city must do uh, to comply with the law. One change um, to clarify existing requirements is to add language that explicitly says that establishing an ADU does not require the undergrounding of utility lines. And then there's one other change that um, is not required by uh, new state law um, and is um, sort of an optional amendment that is being proposed 
um, to uh, address some issues that have come up recently with AP applications and uh, to reflect what some of uh, other jurisdictions in Santa Cruz County are doing. And it has to do with this class of ADUs that's subject to limited standards. So in state law, um, there's certain types of ADUs where only um, standards related to setbacks and height and size um, can be imposed by the city and other standards related to things like um, design or landscaping cannot uh, be imposed. And so one type of these ADUs subject to limited standards is an internal ADU, which means an existing floor area, say an existing home where the floor area is divided um, to create two units when there was only one previously. And um, what state law says is that uh, if you have an internal ADU, um, 150 square feet of new area can be added beyond the existing floor area if that new floor area is used only for ingress and egress. And what um, the proposed <coughs> amendments say is to uh, liberalize that, make it a little bit more flexible and permissive to say that if you have a ground floor um, internal AB, ADU that you're establishing, you can add 150 square feet on the ground floor for any purpose, uh, whether it's you know, to put in a bathroom or to enhance internal circulation. That's allowed. It doesn't have to be just for ingress and egress. But if you're adding floor area on a, on a second floor, then it's more restrictive and in line with state law um, allow, allows that additional 150 square feet only if it's for ingress and egress. And the reason that this is being proposed is because staff has received some applications or some inquiries um, wanting to establish an internal ADU and needing a little bit more uh, floor area in order to utilize the ADU subject to limited standards provision. Uh, this is also something that um, I believe the city of Santa Cruz, maybe the county allows as well as a way to encourage um, internal ADUs, which is a way to increase dwelling units without substantially or noticeably uh, increasing the uh, size and bulk and mass of the existing building. So that's one proposed amendment that, that's not mandated by state law. Another has to do with um, one-story detached ADUs. So currently, a one-story detached ADU um, that's 800 square feet or less and 16 feet or less um, is eligible for the limited standards only if it's new construction. Uh, the proposed amendments uh, expand that and apply it to both new construction and existing structures. And the, motivated, the motivation for that is to sort of encourage and incentivize um, uh, the repurposing of existing accessory structures to establish a new ADU. So that's the ADUs. Um, the next topic of interest is parking in the R1 front setback area. So the existing code uh, contains standards uh, related to the subject and it limits parking space in the front and the exterior side setback to 40% of the lot with up to a maximum of 20 feet. It allows 14 feet width in the front setback area, regardless of lot width. Um, but it does allow for the Planning Commission to approve a larger parking area within the setback um, with a design permit. Um, and because of the uh, typical width and configuration of R1 lots in Capitola, staff has found that this existing standard has not been working well um, and proposes uh, amendments that would allow for a 10-foot width for a single space within the front setback or 18 feet for um, two side-by-side -side spaces. Um, but if there are two side-by-side -side spaces, it would require a ribbon or a Hollywood design for these two spaces where only the area that's used um, for the wheels um, is paved and the rest of it is landscaped. Um, and then also the proposed amendments also limit uh, the driveway apron at the curb to 14 feet. So here's a graphic that illustrates the proposed amendment. 
So here you have a single family home in an R1 lot. Here's the street. And within the required front step back, um, two parking spaces would be allowed for a max with a maximum width of 18 feet. Um, but uh, uh, a uh, ribbon or Hollywood design um, parking spaces would be required to minimize the amount of uh, paving that's within that front step back. So the next topic of interest is the electric vehicle charging station. So within the existing code, there are standards um, uh, where for EV charging stations that apply only um, for uses with 25 parking spaces or an addition um, or remodel um, that increases an existing parking lot of 50 or more spaces, that's 10% or more. So this is really only applying, as the code is written now, to large, larger parking lots serving larger uses. Um, if the EV charging station requirement uh, kicks in, uh, there is a standard that's requiring one charging station in parking lots with 25 to 49 spaces. Um, and then if you have more than, um, if, if you have 50 or more parking spaces, then you have one additional charging station for each 50 space increment. So this is a standard that has been in the code, I think, for a while. Um, and is no longer consistent with state law, which is c constantly evolving um, and requiring more um, as the state uh, transitions more to decarbonizes and transitions more to an electric vehicle. So the proposed amendments reflect that and uh, remove the specific uh, standard for number of spaces and instead references the building code. Um, uh, anticipating that even uh, the standard that is, exists today likely will, will change over time. Um, another change to the standards is uh, adding a limit to the size of digital screens, uh, limiting it to two square feet, and also requiring screening on lots with six or more spaces. So th there are some alternatives to this that are mentioned in the staff report. You know, the city could specify in the zoning code the number of required charging stations and periodically amend the zoning code to match state law. Um, you know, this would make sense if the city wanted to go above and beyond what state is requiring. Um, another option is to codify um, the required ministerial process to approve these charging stations. Um, that's not something that we are proposing in these amendments or recommending um, because that's a detailed uh, process that is probably more appropriate for the building code, and I think it's um, sufficient to reference the state law, the government code section that outlines that approval process. So part of the reason uh, staff is proposing the digital screen size uh, lim limitation is that there is this emerging interest and maybe even a trend to incorporate advertisements um, in uh, EV charging stations, including large um, digital screens that display um, these advertisement staff, uh, recently received an inquiry um, uh, to, uh, for one of these. And because of that, uh, has found it um, to be a good idea to specify in the code what the rules are for these. Um, this is an image that I pulled from a, from a um, uh, advertising industry website sort of identifying these um, as the future of outdoor advertising. Okay, the next topic of interest is generators. Um, there is the, the existing code is silent on rules for generators and whether or not they can be located within required um, setbacks and yards. So the proposed amendments would prohibit generators in the front and side setbacks. Um, but would allow a generator within five feet of a rear setback if necessary to accommodate that generator. So let's say, for example, a, a home was uh, had its uh, rear building wall right at the rear setback. Uh, that homeowner wanted to install a generator. Uh, the proposed amendment would allow for that generator um, to be behind that rear building line and project within five feet, but only if needed to accommodate the generator. Uh, there's also language of limiting testing hours um, to daytime, um, as well as prohibiting freestanding generators that supply service to RVs or trailers. 
Okay, the next topic of interest is minor modifications. Uh, in the code, a minor modification is a type of approval um, that allows for a small adjustment to a physical dimension, such as a setback of up to 10%. This is an alternative to a variance where you don't have to make the difficult variance findings. And this is something that requires planning commission review and approval. Uh, the proposed amendment would allow for a community development director action on the proposed amendment if that project does not otherwise require planning commission review. Uh, and staff is proposing this amendment um, because there have been examples of uh, recent applications where there is no other need for um, planning commission review, but the applicant is requesting a small adjustment to um, a setback um, and it needed to go to the planning commission where um, it was not a uh, it was not a big deal and it was something that could have been reasonably approved at the time. Okay, so um, I think I, I saved the two topics of I think most interest to many planning commissioners for the end, and that's second story decks and balconies and roof decks. Um, so I'll talk about those and then that will be the end of my presentation. So second story decks and balconies. In the code currently, uh, I think as you all know, it requires a design permit. Um, and uh, within the newly adopted objective standards um, for a multifamily um, use that has uh, upper story or multifamily decks and balconies, it's prohibited if it's abutting um, the R1 district. And so um, in light of prior planning commission discussion and direction on the subject, uh, staff has put forward proposed amendments um, that would apply in the R1 zone and the RM zone that's abutting the R1, uh, dealing with uh, deck and balcony orientation, property line setbacks, and projection of building walls. So here's a diagram that illustrates the proposed standards. And in this diagram, the heavy line is um, the required second store building wall setback um, as it would apply on a 40 by 80 parcel. And then this hatch area is where a deck or balcony um, would be permitted. So anything outside of this hatched area, um, a, deck or a second story deck or balcony would not be permitted. Um, so here's the street. So this is the front. Um, so the front uh, second story deck or balcony would be subject to the same setback as um, the building wall. And that would be the case for the street side as well. Uh, for the rear, there would be a greater uh, a setback for the deco balcony than what is required for the second story building wall. And then for the interior side, um, if there's no single family dwelling there, um, let's say there's open space, for example, or a different zoning district, that it would be the same as, uh, the setback would be the same as for the second story building wall. But if there is a single family dwelling um, abutting the interior side, property line, uh, the deck or balcony would not be permitted um, on that building wall facing that, um, that adjacent property. And, there, and so those are the setbacks. There's some other rules as well that are proposed in addition to the setback. Um, and that primarily is that it cannot project more than six feet from the building wall um, to, which it, to which it's attached. So that's the second story decks and balconies. Uh, related to that is roof decks. So within the existing code, uh, roof decks require a design permit. And um, within the newly adopted objective standards, a roof deck is prohibited um, uh, for a multifamily or mixed use residential project um, on a parcel that abuts R1. So in the proposed amendment, uh, they include a new roof deck definition. Uh, such a definition doesn't currently exist. And um, it would prohibit roof decks in the R1 
and any parcel abutting R1. Uh, it would require a five-foot setback from the building wall closest to the property line. Uh, it would allow railing to project above the maximum building height, and it would limit structures within a roof deck only to structures that are necessary in order to access the roof deck from the um, uh, building below. So, um, so that's the roof deck, and that concludes my um, overview of the uh, topics of interest. The staff's recommendation, as we reflect in the staff report, is to accept the presentation on these proposed amendments and to consider forwarding a positive recommendation, recommendation on the ordinance to the city council. And what we're recommending in terms of the process of this agenda item is um, receive any public comment on the amendment um, uh, before the commission's deliberation. And then after that, what we would recommend is to go through each of the topics of interest um, and for each of them to determine if the Planning Commission can support the uh, amendment as uh, proposed and drafted by staff or if some uh, modification needs to be made to it. And we can pull up the text of the proposed amendment to look at that, um, if that would be uh, useful to the Planning Commission. And we can also revisit uh, slides that I showed in the presentation if that would help as well. Uh, and then after we've gone through each topic of interest and the proposed amendment, disposed of each of them, uh, to review any other proposed amendments if desired. Uh, planning commissioners may have um, other amendments with which they wish to discuss or propose uh, modifications. Um, and then that would hopefully put us into a place where the planning commission tonight um, would be able to take action and forward recommendation to the city council. So with that, um, I, think I will stop sharing my screen and, um, and conclude my presentation and hand it back to the chair. Is there further staff presentation? There is not, so. So what I heard Ben say, and I think I agree, is um, so what we'll do well, first of all, I suspect that we are not going to get through this in the next 20 minutes. So the question is, is if we're going to have people talking uh, to other topics, do, can, we, can we halt this at 7 or 7.10 and then switch topics and then come back to it? Or, and then if it runs too late, we can do a continuance? I believe that's fine, that we can... Uh, so put, let's put the item let's on see how so hold let's see how many topics we can get through and then and okay. then if we have and then we'll we'll put a halt to it and then maybe come back to it if sure. we can. Yeah. So what I like to do then is uh, rather than the typical sequence, which is would be questions by uh, the planning commission, it sounds like it'd be better to get questions and comments kind of at the same time, unless there's just overall general questions we would like to we would like to ask Ben or staff. Because then we can get the public comment in, and then we can hit each, hit each the topic one by one. Public comment in, and then we can talk about each topic. All right. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Can I make a, Peter, a suggestion to staff on, on these kinds of issues where we have lots of verbiage. Can we get a paper copy of the documents? It's really difficult to follow it online. Yes. It yes. Would help <laughs> That's so what much. I asked for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah it would be quite helpful. <clears throat> It hurts a few trees, but you know it helps us and, a lot. And with any agenda, anytime you'd like a paper copy, just let us know, and we'll print one and we can deliver it. Okay. Okay. So then let's move on to um, public comments on this item on zoning um, code amendments. Are there any public comments? So there are two attendees on Zoom, and we have uh, Nara here with to make public comment. Nara, can, are you able? I can, look, I can do it, Peter. Oh, you can? Yeah. Go ahead, Nara. Hi there. Uh, Nara Dalbaca here um, representing the Apothecarium, which is one of your two uh, permitted um, licensed dispensaries in the city of Capitola. 
Um, we're just here tonight to voice our support for the the amended, um, the proposed amendment. Uh, it's been really hard for um, Apothecarium to uh, to be visible along that stretch of 41st um, without a monument sign that most of the other um, most of the other businesses in the mall are able to utilize. Um, and we believe that um, it will increase the um, number of folks who are aware that we're here, um, and uh, that will in turn um, lead to hopefully some increased uh, revenue for the city, um, as well as um, for the uh, for the legal cannabis businesses that you do have in the city, um, which are struggling right now to compete with the unlicensed and um, illegal illegal ones that are operating around the state. So we really appreciate um, staff uh, and their thoughtfulness on this, um, their communication on this with us, and um, look forward to being able to uh, to have the same abilities to um, to generate, um, uh, or to have the same visibility that some of the other uh, businesses do. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delbaca. Um, any other comments? No, no further comments on Zoom. Okay, so now we can move it back anybody to. Anybody in the audience? If there's anybody in the audience who wants to discuss this, please come up to the podium. And I see none. So we'll move on to um, deliberation and questions. Let's hit them one by one. What was the, can you bring up the, the uh, agenda items again? What, we, what was our first topic? <laughs> it was pergolas. Pergolas. <laughs> Oh, it was could you could you bring large commercial uses? Oh yeah. <laughs> let's let's bring up the bring up the Ben. Could you bring up the presentation again so we could yeah look at your there we go. Uh, th was that it? There you go. So pages one oh nine to twenty three. So are there any questions? So what was the uh, impetus for this? Uh, the impetus for this was um, when a larger commercial use comes in, we thought it would be good for the Planning Commission to get review of it. So if a really large, if a Whole Foods came in along, another, you know, something similar to Whole Foods came in along 41st Avenue, right now it's a permitted use, and there are impacts when you're looking at circulation and um, just access so we thought it should definitely be reviewed by the Planning Commission rather than staff. So the design would be looked at by the Planning Commission, but all the, when you're looking at a conditional use permit, it really looks at the different impacts tied to uses. So we thought for larger uses, they should come before Planning Commission. There wasn't anything that occurred between the time we adopted the zoning code and today that it just kind of came to into your mind that you know, in, in the past, I believe, in our, under our old code, a conditional use would be tied to larger retail. Um, and that was... Overlooked. I think it was overlooked. So, yeah. There was an exception for larger uses within the mall or within a master plan develop or master use pl program. And that still exists within our CUP criteria. If you, if you built a large um, multi-tenant commercial building, you could also apply for a... A, um, master use permit in which you could get large, you know, you could get some flexibility in your uses. Speaking of Whole Foods, before Whole Foods was approved, uh, there was an application for PetSmart there, which was denied. So I, I don't have any <laughs> problem with the language that they're proposing for this large retail use. Um, uh, I think large retail uses can have impacts on existing uh, areas change of use so I and it was in the prior code that we had so I see no reason so everybody so should we uh, vote on these one by one and, and have a recommendation that yes on large retail spaces we would propose that that, that be adopted and move forward because yeah, again if, if we if don't get through this any item that seems like not everyone's yeah. in agreement I think we can do that but for this I'm seeing consensus, consensus so we can yeah. move on all right, consensus it is. All right, let's move on to the like next the good topic old days. then. <laughs> Cannabis retail. I uh, had the same question about that till I heard the public comment about what the impetus for the change was, but now I know. So. Yeah. 
So my question is, uh, why, um, wh why bring it out as a separate item in the code at all? Um, if, it's, if it's to be consistent with other stores, why flag it as a, as a unique item? I agree with you. I mean, I think it's a legal use. Uh, I don't think that we want to start having different sign regulations for um, different businesses. Yeah. Different businesses, whether we, you know, it's not up to us to say we like them or we don't like them. I think yeah. they should all be treated the same. It's just part of the genesis of uh, cannabis industry coming into communities, and they kind of tried to make it okay, but not quite okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, ben, I don't know if you can, yeah, zoom in a little more. So there, there are several standards tied to cannabis uh, retail that towards signs. So the the one request was to remove the overall square footage and the limitation of one sign. The other limitations, if you'd like to recommend removing them, is that the sign may include on only the name of the business and one green cross. Um, this That's under A. B, we've already said we should scratch because it's the maximum 15 square feet. C was signs may not have any reference through symbol or language to cannabis with the exception of one green cross. And then C is signs shall not be directly illuminated except during operating hours. And then the last standard was that signs shall otherwise be subject to the Planning Commission review through a sign permit application in accordance with the chapter. So if you'd like to remove the standards for what can be included in the sign, just the name of the business and the green cross, um, we can, and the illumination standard, we can definitely uh, bring that recommendation to City Council. I think they're a legal business. I think they should be treated like other exactly. businesses. Exactly, I see no reason to discriminate. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I would agree as well. Okay, okay I'm consensus. seeing consensus to so not only make so the recommendation. This, this, this would entirely remove the sign section um, and the cannabis business would comply comply with the sign code like any other business. We, we exactly. see a lot of keep on trucking figures out there <laughs> with next right. to the green. <laughs> Butterfly pigeon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you have our recommendation then? Do we, yes, we have consensus on that as well? Yep. Uh, Let's move on to pergolas then. <laughs> pergolas. Right. Did this, was this clear? Um, <laughs> I, have a, I, have a I have a question on pergolas. <laughs> sure. It, it, was, it was mentioned that an attached pergola can extend four feet into the side yard setback. Well, right. most setbacks in the jewel box, the side yards are four feet. So does that mean if I attach a pergola to a house, you can bring it all the way out to the property line? <laughs> um, ben, on, on the pergolas, is there a man, like a a minimum setback from the property line requirement in that table? If it's attached to the building, let me, let me pull that up. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think we want things extending into the minimum side yard setback. No. And if it gets closer to three feet, then I think it becomes a fire issue. Well, they, you can have like a shed structure on a property line. And so I would, right, it's at a, just a non-habitable structure. So why wouldn't the pergola meet the same type of requirement? But doesn't it have to be fire rated on the side that's on the property line? No, because it's not a habitable structure. I mean, if I'm correct. The accessory building is allowed in the side yard setback. Yeah. yeah. It has to be less than 100 square feet. Right, like 100 and something. Right. So, but and it's, and I it's build not a 40 attached foot to the building. If the, if the side of side of my house is 40 feet long, you could build a pergola 40 feet long all the way to the property line. Yeah, like a, a shade structure, right? So I'm just wondering, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to clarify. So these are ones that are attached to the building is what we're talking right. about. Right. And so when I presented this, I, I think I maybe overly simplified um, what the proposed standard is and uh, what What's showed on the screen is, um, is the entirety of what's proposed. So it does, it does there is a uh, minimum distance from property line. So the front is 10 feet um, for a pergola attached to a building wall. So um, if your building wall is 
10 feet or closer to your front property line, you could not take advantage of this um, and have a pergola that could be done. But this in, interior site so is three feet. What about side yard? Three feet. Three feet. Okay, because I can't see, read his screen up there. You know, you should yeah. have had a printout. And interior, <laughs> interior side is three feet, so it, a Kay. side that's facing another neighbor is three, it has to be three feet away. Exterior side is a five foot requirement. Okay. But it also, um, they're not, oh yeah. So no max for the rear, except that there's a required five foot setback from the prop rear property yeah. line. And no max for an interior side, except that it has to keep a three foot setback from the property line. Okay. So you can't build it on the property line. Nope. It has to be three feet. That's fine. Cannot. That answers my question. So I have a question on that same page, page 129, that, that, that very chart, it's, uh, but it includes outdoor showers where you say uh, outdoor shower is not allowed in the front and not allowed on the side. And I'm more just wondering if that would be more clear if instead of not allowed, you'd have zero feet. So in other words, if you had an atrium or some b big recess in your, s in your side yard and, and the deep into that recess was an outdoor shower, I would think that would be allowed, even though it's on the side of the house. What you, I think what we care about is it doesn't project at all into the setback. And so a, a, a zero feet would be clear in my mind. Right? So the reason why we're adding this is we've done a lot of our inspections, we go out and if we live in a beach town, everyone wants an outdoor shower. We've seen them in the strangest places, like in the entryway right not attached to a building or anything but attached to a fence right near when you first drive in your driveway and just the impact to a neighbor having an outdoor shower that close to their house and not tied to your house so we thought it would be appropriate to keep them out of the front yard so there's more privacy um, but yes by putting not allowed then it, it could not be anywhere in that front setback area it could not project into the front setback area. But if there was a recess in the building, so if the front facade of the building is at 15 feet and then it's recessed to 20, that recessed area is not a projection into the setback. Right, but it, according so to this, it, it would not be allowed anyway because it just yeah. says it's in the front, therefore it's not allowed. So that's why I say if it said zero feet, it means you couldn't project at all into the setback, front side or back. Correct. So if you'd like to switch that to I zero feet, it, it could allow some flexibility to have showers it, on the front facade of a building, although it would have to be set further back than the 15 foot standard. It, to me, that's that's reasonable, especially if, especially if it's on a side yard. I mean, if you're. Yeah, I agree with you. As long as they're set back, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they're not in the setbacks, right. then it's, I think they should be able to have them. So it couldn't be in the front on a fence because then you'd be in the front yard setback. Correct. But, yeah. um, so perhaps staff could consider rewording that a bit. He's already done. Zero so feet, Ben is go. gonna make modifications as we go along. <laughs> okay. Can he blow up his screen a little bit? <laughs> we can see I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in to the maximum extent. Is that a little better? That's better. I'm not Thank quite you. sure what you can okay. Yeah, so so you don't even need the words not allowed. You just have zero feet. That I, I would say whatever you think is clearest. To me, we're zero feet. We're happy to make that change. There you go. Just click delete that. Not allowed part. There you go. Zero feet. You're not allowed any projection into the setback on the outdoor showers. Thank you. Anything else on pergolas? Sorry, I got a little distracted. <laughs> <laughs> no, the rest of it I'm fine with. Everybody else? Is it clear? Everybody I'm happy with this? Bewildered by it all. So. I, I didn't have any. I'll uh, pass on this one. <laughs> didn't have any uh, big issues on that either. Uh, so are we okay? One consensus on that one as well. Yes, it looks like. Yes, sounds like All we have right. consensus on purple. Um, I think we're still pretty good on time. Let's go on to the next accessory dwelling units, page one thirty nine. Yeah, I have a question on that one also. Okay. 
Go ahead, Mick. In the presentation, it was stated you could add an additional 150 square feet uh, for an attached ADU. And I'm wondering, since ADUs don't require setbacks, can that attached 150 square feet go into the setback area? No. So um, ADUs, so the, the link here is that it's an existing structure. So the existing structure can be in the setback areas, but any addition to the existing structure has to comply with the, I, I want to say, four-foot setback for the ADU for rear and side yards. So that new 150 square feet would not be allowed to be in the setback area. Okay. Yeah, I, and I, had, I had a question or comment on this in general, which is uh, this area is one where the state is uh, taking the lead and Every session of the legislature, they pass several new bills dealing with this, and our code is, as soon as we get it printed, it's out of date. And so, I mean, we could say this about everything in the code, that it's subject to state law, but this section is different in my mind, it's sort of because it really is a state-controlled issue. Because especially there's conflict, Capitola Center doesn't want us in, to a certain extent, increase densities, whereas the state wants us to. So somehow it seems like it would be good to not have to do a code amendment every year and somehow incorporate the, in, in generally, universally, the state changes as they come through. The one, um, <coughs> one, one reason I would suggest that we do update the code is that we've built objective standards into our code of um, how, you know, when you have a secondary dwelling unit that it should be oriented towards the, your backyard <coughs> rather than facing your, you know, the approach be towards your neighbors. So we've built in some standards to really protect the uh, objective okay. standards for neighbors, but all of, yeah, all the, there's so many cleanups to this that are minor <coughs> tweaks due to the new What I would suggest, maybe Ben could come up with some language that just sort of is a general statement to the effect that as the uh, state laws are modified and minimum standards are imposed, they're automatically incorporated in the uh, in our ordinance unless we do otherwise. That's a great recommendation. Yeah, I, I agree. That's an excellent recommendation. Well, can we just, it would be just a statement that says this ordinance is superseded by Yeah, well, state. Ben, that's what yeah. Ben's the expert at. Yeah. 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 In, in, in case of conflict between this ordinance and state law, state law governs. Yeah, that's a simple way of putting it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any concerns with ADUs? Any more ADU questions or and ben, it, as as it evolves somehow get some some concept in there that the state law is a dynamic process. <laughs> Anything else on ADUs? All right, next topic. Parking. So I had a question on that one, and, and as you mentioned, the ribbon parking. Uh, the ribbon park, if it was just one car, it does, the Hollywood parking isn't required. You could have a solid driveway if it was just the 10-foot driveway, right? But if, only when you add the second one, do they both have to be Hollywood? That's, that's what is proposed. Okay, I just want to be clear on that. So I have a question about that. Um, I don't have any problem with the 18 feet and the uh, Hollywood style parking. I do have a problem with it if we're going to go to a 14 foot curb cut, because then that's going to require you to drive over whatever you've got in the middle of your ribbons to if there's another vehicle parked there to get out. So, you know, we got examples where they showed this lovely grass growing in the ribbons or, you know, those kinds of things. That won't work if people can't back straight out and they have to constantly be driving over what's in the middle. So I could live with it all if you were allowed to have, you know, an 18-foot 18 18 foot curb cut okay. to match the driveway. 
And and I would suggest that it be up to 18 feet so right. that in some scenarios we like to protect mm -hmm. the street parking. That's the, that's what we're always coming up against is street parking versus the curb cut. So, so who would make that? Yeah, uh, but if you're going to make them do the ribbons, then you can't reduce it to 14 feet. If it goes to 14 feet, then they have to have the option of having a solid driveway. Yeah, or, or, you just, or, or just have the second driveway ha be the ribbon and, and, and allow for, of the two, but one could be solid. Can't, you still can't. Yeah, you would. You would, uh, oh, you st well, yeah. you're right. <laughs> you still couldn't do it. So if you're going to do 14 feet, you get a solid driveway if you're going to do... 18 feet, you get have to do the ribbon driveway. Retire artificial lawn, and then it won't get hurt when it's driven over. <laughs> well, but not everybody wants that. <laughs> I mean, and I so think the idea is for <coughs> it to be a, a permeable surface, not put down plastic and more plastic on top of it. Or you can use the blocks that the lawn grows up in the middle of. Well, the, I guess the the, you, what the issue you're bringing up is what's more important, the size of the curb cut or the permeable surface slash landscaping associated with the ribbon. And it's, so it's, it's like you know, you're saying it's got to be one or the other. you got to pick so what the, you, the you think is more important. Mm -hmm. The other solution, I've seen um, in other places that once you uh, cross the sidewalk, s in some areas they'll do maybe like a solid strip of pavers that's about five feet deep. And I, I'm now I'm realizing why the, maybe the reason behind that is so that as you turn in, you're on a solid surface, and then it goes to ribbon. Um, that's throughout Cape Cod. <laughs> you always see that design. So um, that's yeah, something I we could look I into if, if it's the two, solution. You give people two choices. Yep. Okay. And then they could decide. If you want to have the two spaces, then you need to do the Hollywood-style driveway, but you get a curb cut that allows you to back directly out. And if you want to do, you know, solid driveway, then you only get the 14 foot wide. But the, Katie's point is, is that we want to have an opportunity to review the, the size of the curb cut. So if you're going to automatically allow an 18 foot curb cut, then, it, you know, if there's a parking issue, then we don't, won't get a chance to review it. But I, I guess, you know, we give away parking all the time. On Hill Street, we got rid of the parking on one side of the street to have a bicycle lane. Mm -hmm. You know, we get rid of parking in the village so that we can have the uh, outdoor dining out there. I mean, <coughs> suddenly we're going to pick on one particular person because their neighbors don't want the street parking to go away. I mean, how are we going to decide who gets to regulate the street parking? I mean, maybe you could have it come to the Planning Commission and they could regulate that, but I don't think it's something that... I think in the neighborhoods, especially in the North 40s and the Jewel Box area, not so much in Clifford Heights, but where parking on street is a mm -hmm. premium, an 18-foot curb cut just eliminates that, it's par some of the parking. So. You know, I, th I think the size of the curb cut is more important than the ribbon parking. <coughs> okay. So you're saying let's go get rid of the ribbon parking but stick with the 14-foot wide curb cut. I'm saying allow, leave it just like it is. Have r require ribbon parking if you're going to have two side-by-side -side spaces but a 14-foot curb cut. That doesn't particularly work <laughs> for me, but that's so okay. okay. So, but 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 perhaps the compromise then is what Katie suggested, which is a ribbon ribbon parking doesn't have to extend the full length of the 20 feet parking space, right? That last five feet. So the second the be solid pavers, the right? The second the second unit where it, where you'd have to do the swerve out could be partially <laughs> paved. I don't know. Maybe so since so we're going to continue some of this, we could continue. The, the standard as it is just requires that the Planning Commission review it and approve it, so to go beyond the 14 feet of width. So if you'd like to review each of these individually, knowing that there is this um, balance that has to be made between street parking and driveway parking, we could scratch this uh, suggestion. 
and not move forward with it. Cause I think this is a non-issue, personally. Yeah, that works for me. I think okay. we should scratch this one. Okay. I agree. Okay, I'm good with that, too. Okay, that's consensus. So we're not going to move forward with that red line. So, so by scratching um, this entire well, uh, parking in front step back amendment is not moving forward? Correct. We'll go back to the language that we had where Planning Commission needs so to make one an of, exception. One of the concerns with the existing language is that um, the 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 fourteen the fourteen foot the, the dimensions as it was previously written were not working well for typical lot sizes. And so we always had to review them. Yeah. And we'll so continue we'll to review, review them. them. <laughs> we'll continue okay. to review them. Okay. Peter, it's ten after seven. If you want. Yeah, I was going to say before we, we move to the next question, maybe we should talk about switching topics for a bit since we have a large audience. Could we get halfway through? Uh, well, we got through the easy ones. I don't know yeah. if we got halfway through. Yeah, we, we're yeah. going to need to come back another yeah. session, I think. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, would you like to continue this to the next planning commission on? I think it's November first. December first. Or November 1st. November 1st, because this is a special Third? Yeah. Okay, yeah. November 3rd, or would you like to I pause and come finish this at the end of the evening? Or I'm okay with coming back to it, although well, I, I'm not going to. You want to leave. And also, I mean, we're, this is going to be a long public yeah. hearing. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. I think we should continue Let's to continue November it. 3rd. That gives us time to really study it. Maybe we could get a paper copy so we yes. could yeah. see it. That'd be a good idea. <laughs> Okay. We don't need the ones that we've already had a consensus on. So I'll make okay. that motion that we okay. continue it to November 3rd. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second to continue this item until the next meeting, November 3rd. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. It's unanimous. <coughs> okay. One hour at a time at this point. Okay. So let's move on then to. Yeah. So you wanted to do Monarch Cove in next. This should be short. Those of you who are waiting for Bulb Avenue. Uh, so we'll move on to item B, uh, project number 210267, Monarch Cove in code amendments. Do we have a staff presentation? Yeah, thank you, Chair Welk, and good evening, commissioners. Pull up a brief. <coughs> Put on silent. <coughs> Spam risk, my favorite person. Apologies for that. Uh, so the uh, this item is policy amendments for the Monarch Cove Inn property specifically. <coughs> uh, and what we'll be looking at tonight is a zoning text amendment, a zoning map amendment, and then a corresponding general plan land use map amendment. Um, this only affects three properties in the city uh, that are currently zoned as visitor serving. And uh, the, just the basic request is to uh, bring that into alignment with uh, a, some adjacent properties to the Monarch Cove Inn and have that be an R1 zone with an, a visitor serving overlay. 
uh, kind of like the uh, the village has a visitor serving overlay as well. Um, to some extent, this is a rerun of uh, the comprehensive zoning code update that uh, both the Planning Commission and uh, City Council adopted in the 2020 and 2021 time period. Uh, and then when this was forwarded to the Coastal Commission, the subtopic of the Monarch Cove Inn was discussed pretty extensively. Um, the owner made some statements about uh, both their personal and financial circumstances and their ability to continue running the Monarch Cove Inn, needing some flexibility to manage their estate going forward. <coughs> uh, they did have uh, some positive comments from individual coastal commissioners, but the coastal staff was, uh, was not recommending support. And ultimately, uh, they pulled this item out and asked for it to come back under separate consideration. And so that's, that's the, uh, the effort here this evening is to bring, run it back through the local process in order to get it back before the Coastal Commission. And the Coastal staff also asked for um, additional financial documents to uh, support the owner's statements about uh, feasibility of running the, the inn. Um, so that's also included here in the staff report. And so again, the specific request is just to change uh, to allow a residential use. And um, the owner also talked about their uh, attempts to, to reposition the property and uh, the scale of the property currently um, and some of their attempts to um, bring forward a proposal to uh, increase the property's number of rooms, and they, they actually had two of those, 2001 and 2013, and both of those were met with substantial neighborhood opposition. So they feel like they're uh, in a bit of a position where they, they need to uh, have a change in policy in order to uh, move forward with this property. So this is just an example of the, the map, uh, just be a simple change from purple to yellow with an overlay. Uh, and then as far as the text, it would just pull from, there's actually a, a Monarch Cove chapter that would get rolled into the visitor serving overlay. And so going forward, in order to transition to residential, they would need a use permit. And with regard to the financial documents, uh, the Coastal Commission staff recommended that the city commission those directly so that they'd be independent uh, analysis and included a feasibility study uh, got into profitability and ongoing costs, and then a broker's opinion of value, which is essentially a, an appraisal. And so they looked at, under the various land uses, um, what would the property be worth in the fair market? So the next step would be for the commission to, to forward a recommendation for the city council, and then uh, ultimately the city and the owner would be joint applicants uh, for a review by the Coastal Commission. So this evening what we're asking for is consideration of these proposed amendments, offer comments, and forward a recommendation to Council. Are there any questions of staff by the commissioners? Okay, let's open this up to public comments then. Um, does, are there any members of the public who wish to comment on this particular item? Please come forward uh, to the uh, podium. Uh, our, if not, we can reach out to the um, Zoom folks, if there's anybody there. Seeing no hands on Zoom. Okay, seeing no one stepping forward, let's move on then to Planning Commission deliberation. Anybody wish yeah. to comment on this? Weren't we expecting the applicants on this? We yeah. were, and they knew 7 p.m., so... Um, not seeing the applicant seeing here. Them. I did meet with them today. Comments or a motion? This um, this seems like deja vu, really. Uh, it does. <laughs> we went through all this, and it's kind of become uh, us against the, co the, the the property owner and the city against the coastal commission on this issue. So now what we're saying is we're going to um, approve a change that would is being requested by the property owner and then do battle with the Coastal Commission over that? 
Um, so the Coastal Commission was not opposed to the project when, uh, to the change when it went before them for certification. However, they wanted more information. So they didn't want to pass it at the same time as our, our big zoning code update. So that's why we've gone ahead and done the extra studies. We've been communicating with uh, Coastal Commission staff. So it was really, they made the point that we're not saying to go away. We'd, we will consider this, but we need additional information. So it did take, um, we wanted to bring this along with our code cleanup and our zoning code just to get it all into one package. But it is a separate application from the applicant and they, of course, paid all the um, cost associated with the additional studies as well. It strikes me it's almost an illegal taking of property by the Coastal Commission denying someone the right to <laughs> live in their own house, how they choose to live. I would move approval of the I, I've watched this property for so many years now and it's, it's always seemed so marginal right. as a uh, commercial enterprise. I'll second Nick's motion. So there's a motion to approve by uh, Commissioner Roof and a second by Commissioner Westman. Any further discussion? I will say we, we do need to do a roll call vote for this. Let's do that then, please. Commissioner Christensen. Aye. Commissioner Newman. Aye. Commissioner Ruth. Aye. Oh, Nick. I think the applicant uh, okay. just arrived. Commissioner Westman. Aye. And Chair Wilk. Aye. Thank you. Uh, motion passes unanimously. So let's move on then to. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's inform Mr. Blodgett what he just yeah, got. He, he <laughs> might have helped this case by coming late. <laughs> so we, we just we just passed your item. <laughs> so well, it's gone to the next step forward. Okay. <laughs> You're good, Bob. Congratulations. <laughs> We were speedy. It wasn't very controversial as far as we were concerned. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Done? You're done. <laughs> we want to go. <laughs> well, you're welcome to stay for the next item, which is uh, 3720 Capitola Road. And with that, let's move on to our staff presentation on well, that Mr. Item. Chairman, before we do that, I'm going to uh, have to recuse myself and just for the benefit of the public. We do this because I have an economic interest within 500 feet of the property site. So under the law, I'm not allowed to participate in this. And we'll see you at the next meeting. All right. Very good. See you November 3rd. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening, Commission. Uh, before you this evening, we have a conceptual review um, for 3720 Capitola Road and 1610 Bulb Avenue. Um, the conceptual review is for future annexation of the 1610 property, 1610 Bulb, and a conceptual review of our first community benefit application for the city of Capitola. The proposed community benefit is a senior living facility. I have a few slides just to orient you of photos of the <coughs> current uh, view. So this is from the corner of Capitola Road and Bulb looking towards 41st Avenue. There is a structure uh, behind those trees that is, this is the old dog kennel um, location. And here's looking across the street from Bulb. Next. This is, again, the, the rear of the property. And then this is 1610 Bulb Avenue property here. So, um, and on this slide, I'm, I'm gonna go into first the details of the annexation request. So 3720 uh, Capitola Road is, lo is located within the city limits. 1610 Bulb Avenue is located in the county and is a residential property. Um, in order to annex a property into the city, it must be located within the city's sphere of influence. Our sphere of influence is quite large in Capitola. As you can see, it's the red uh, dotted um, area that includes all of 41st Avenue all the way to the ocean, as well as the majority of Pleasure Point. This is something I will be bringing back to you probably in the next few years as 
uh, LAFCO has reached out to us about our large sphere of influence. And if we don't intend to annex these areas, we do need to revisit the large sphere. So um, next is our zoning code map. And I've highlighted in the blue square <coughs> the area in which this property is located. And this is zooming in to the zoning code or the zoning map. The Capitola boundary is shown with the dashed black line. Uh, the property is shown outlined in red in, there we go, 1610 Bold Avenue. So it is within the sphere of influence. What I'd like you to notice here is this jagged uh, property line or city line, city boundary we have in this area. Um, if I go back to the zoning map, it's, it's really pronounced in this one area, how uh, in and out it goes. So if this, uh, if it were desired by the Planning Commission to see this, um, the annexation move forward, and we're looking at an annexation as well as the, um, the community benefit, but I just want to point out that it would be in alignment with Pono Grill next door, Pono Hawaiian, and then the Chinese restaurant next to that extends even further back. So it would clean up that jagged edge along that road. But Are the two properties in the same ownership? My understanding is that there are two owners, but they're, um, one is owner of both, and there might be a partial ownership of one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is our first community benefits application to come through the city since this new section of code was adopted. The purpose of the community benefit is to establish incentives for applicants to locate and design development projects in a manner that provides a community benefit, a substantial benefit to the community. Um, they're int intended to facilitate redevelopment. The area in which these incentives are allowed to happen within Capitola is around, is like along 41st Avenue and Capitola Road, an area that we're hoping to see redevelop in the future. We also have um, an over, this, this chapter is also applicable to the, um, the theater site and the village, because that is another site that we'd like to see redeveloped. So th that's why these were put in the code. Um, the incentive is only granted when it's not, when they're fulfilling going beyond a requirement of the code or going beyond what's required by the state. Um, it must significantly advance the general plan or substantially exceed the city's minimum requirements. Um, so if someone were to bring in a community benefit, the allowed incentives are that you can get increased floor area up to 2.5 and increased height from 35 feet up to 50. Um, our code outlines specific community benefits that, that qualify and the list is here. I'm going to go through a few of them, but open space, public infrastructure, pedestrian bicycle facilities, low cost visitors serving, transportation options, historic preservation, public parking, green buildings, public art, child care facilities. So those are allowed community benefits. Um, the applicant is applying under number 11 for other community benefits, and these are other community benefits that are proposed by the applicant that are significant or substantial beyond the normal requirements. So who determines if it qualifies under that number 11 category? So it's the Planning Commission and the City Council. The requirement, um, the first step in any uh, a conceptual review application, or I'm sorry, for any um, community benefit application is to first come before Planning Commission and City Council, and um, it's the Planning Commission City Council that have to, it's, um, it's a non-binding input, so it's not a decision, you're not voting tonight, but it's uh, as to whether or not the request for incentives is worthy of consideration. If you find it to be worthy of consideration, um, you can ask for modifications and give guidance because this is not, this is the first step. This is not the actual application for the development. So is there questions with that? Does that make sense? Um, second step is that it w they would resubmit an application um, that would be reviewed by the Planning Commission for a hearing and recommendation of the City Council, and the last step is it would need uh, City Council approval. So it's a two-step public review process. There are five findings tied to community benefits. Uh, first is that it must provide a substantial benefit to the community and advance the goals of the general plan. 
there must be adequate public services and infrastructure to accommodate um, that they've provided letters from the county and, and the water departments and let us know that they are they do there is adequate services um, the public benefit must exceed the minimum requirements of the zoning code and any other provisions of local state or federal law there is no requirement for assisted living within our code so that's uh, for that alone they can't beat our exceed our requirement um, it minimizes adverse impacts to the neighboring properties to the greatest extent possible and also it enhances coastal resources so those are the five findings that must be met when when such project would go to the, the be submitted to the Planning Commission and the City Council for decision um, tonight we have Greg Irwin here um, to present um, uh, yeah, why, why don't we, do you have a thumb, did you, you email me the, okay, I've got to go into my email really quick, so I'm going to stop sharing. So this is Rafi Ortiz. He's going to begin the presentation, I believe. Let me share screen. I don't think it's in our typical format of a PowerPoint. So is this okay, Rafi, if we go uh, here? Sure, you have both a PDF and a, and a PowerPoint, but either one is fine. And if we could just page through. Okay. Uh, so really, this is just a, a short introduction to the proposed project. Really, our intent here is to provide a little bit of context and background and to introduce Greg Irwin, who leads the architectural firm. Could you speak directly into the microphone so we can hear uh, Is you? this better? Yeah. Better. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then it's to introduce Greg Irwin of the architecture firm, Irwin & Associates, to explain a little bit more our thinking on the design. Let me just introduce uh, who's working on this, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So uh, my background is uh, I was raised in Santa Cruz and, and teamed with a developer who's built uh, over 250 housing units throughout the county. What we've done is we've searched for um, kind of the best operators, and so we found Irwin Architects uh, which is probably the, the best architectural firm for senior assisted living housing in the state. From an operator standpoint, uh, we've connected with Paradigm Senior Living, which operates senior living facilities throughout the country and actually has experience doing it in Santa Cruz County. If you could page through. <coughs> uh, so there, there there's an economic reason for doing this, and I'm going to get into that, but really for me, uh, it's very personal. Um, Flor Jean Ball was my grandmother. She lived actually across the street from here next to the fire station. 
She would take me to St. John's Episcopal Church on Depot Hill. She sold her art at the craft gallery in the village. And her plan uh, was to live at home and die in her sleep with all her family around her. And it turns out most of us want that kind of outcome. And it didn't work out for her. And the reason was, what, we, what she didn't plan on, what most of us don't plan on is, uh, that she became a bit debilitated and w no matter uh, the caregiving at home needed uh, real assisted, uh, the kind of care that you get in an assisted living facility. By the time we realized that she needed that, we reached out to those facilities and learned that there was a waiting list because um, it turns out most people don't plan for this kind of event. There was a waiting list, um, there was no availability and what happens in that situation is you then get kicked down to a skilled nursing facility. So if, you're if you've ever visited the skilled nursing facility on Wharf Road, I'd encourage you to visit it. I've been to every one in this county. My grandmother has been to most of them. And she, her life ended in one of those. And so I'm thinking a lot about my parents, uh, for whom this project is probably too late. I'm thinking about myself, I'm thinking about a lot of people who would like to live at home, who will need a different kind of housing and a kind of housing that there's not a great deal of in the county. So we'll go through that in a little bit of detail. If you could page through. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the market demand. Um, we define market demand as a primary and secondary area. The primary area is that in which 80% of uh, the units would be occupied by people within a seven mile radius. And so you see that sketched out there and the remaining 20% would come from the adjacent uh, neighboring areas. If you could page through. Uh, this chart's a little hard to see from this distance, but the main point is that the fastest growing segment of the population in Capitola is the age group 75 and over with an income of 50,000 or more per year. It is the fastest growing segment in the city and those people need housing. The nearest facility comparable to what we're contemplating is Aegis. They're currently at 100%. So really, you know, there are economic benefits to this, but I wanna highlight that I think by far the most important is that the intention is to provide housing to people with this kind of need. Assisted living is something that is um, becoming a big topic around the country. Seniors generally aren't here in these kinds of venues to be able to advocate for themselves. They may be homebound or they're close to ending up in a facility like this. So really the benefit that we're, that we're really talking about is housing for a segment of the population that's fast growing and that needs assistance if they are to stay in their local community. If not, then they're looking at alternatives outside the immediate community or maybe even further away. The rest you can read for yourself. Um, an 80 unit facility, which is what we're contemplating, would employ approximately 70 caregivers. That has a, a payroll flow, of course. Um, and a developed property like this, of course, has you know, tax revenue. But again, it's, this is really about providing housing. This is a chart uh, that you can read, but one of the things that we looked at uh, in, in talking to people was what is the level of traffic that a facility like this generates and so we looked at projects of comparable size and um, I'll, I'll just state the obvious but residents in these facilities do not own cars they don't travel their families visit them um, so really the traffic <coughs> is family and it's employees of these kinds of facilities and so if you look at traffic flows, and here's where I might need uh, Greg's help in explaining this. Uh, if you look at traffic flows, we compare this to office buildings, which are generally considered uh, low impact <laughs> facilities. And uh, by sort of time range throughout the day and the evening, uh, what we see is that the traffic generated generally corresponds to about half the traffic load that you would see in an office park.
what I'd like to do is let uh, Greg Irwin walk you through some of the design considerations that he came up with, and I'll let him take it from here. Good evening. Is that close enough? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let me start by saying senior housing, unfortunately, is one of the only development products that doesn't have a right of use in any city in the United States. It always needs a CUP, which is a, a sad thing uh, for our seniors. Um, what we're coming here tonight with is actually kind of, it's, it's a multi-piece thing that we have to bring together at once. So we're looking for the annexation, first of all, of the uh, second piece to the front piece, which then matches the properties as described previously going down the street. Um, so we have an unknown here, right? We're starting with a unknown design factor of will it be annexed, will it not? So we designed with the, the safest, if not, what could we put on the, the lot? So we looked at splitting it into two pieces, the rear property for parking, the front for the assisted living. Um, it, it is, uh, parking is not even a one story building, it's less intrusive to an exact neighbor than a up to what the what that would be allowed three-story building so we're looking at this from how we can be as neighborly as possible um, because of that that's why we're coming here with the added ask for the fourth floor because we are not building any stories on the back half of the property so um, you know, as I said, we've got to bring these kind of in tandem, a design with the annexation at this time. Um, but we also designed that if the annexation doesn't happen, that we can then separate out the two pieces and hopefully move forward in that direction. <coughs> so, um, you know, in a way, our, our hands are some, were somewhat tied in what we could bring to you and how we bring it because it has to come together. So that, that, um, that's where we're coming from with this project. Um, you know, we're here to answer whatever questions you or anyone else uh, here has tonight. Um, and know that this is kind of the first step of bringing this to you, that we have to start with these two pieces, or three, the, the project, the uh, additional ask for the floor, and the annexation. So it's actually three different pieces here we're bringing to you at once, um, because there's no way really to separate them. So thank you. Greg, would you like to Thank you, Greg. go over the slides and? Yeah, so we can, yeah. So I think, it, um, you know, the back parking lot there matches the depth of the parking for the um, restaurant next door. So that's um, where that comes from. You can see that we come have a parking lot there in the back that we circle and enter the building from there. Um, the uh, Capitola Street, we've, uh, created an outdoor patio to bring the residents to the street and have an outdoor and become part of the community. Um, you know, we looked at all the goals of where Capitola Boulevard from a planning standpoint <coughs> is looking to move and we're trying to address as many of those items as we can. So you can see this is a front entry, a uh, little courtyard, private courtyard for the residents also. Um, first floor is assisted living uh, with a dining room and activity spaces for seniors. Second floor is a memory care floor for those that uh, need help. Um, and if, if anyone needs more descriptions between assisted living and memory care, we can go into that. I just will skip that part for now for time. The third floor again then would be assisted living. And I believe the fourth floor matches. The fourth matches. floor matches, so yes. So, and then we've got a, a four-story um, residential-ish piece. And then, you know, architecture always gets interesting when, you know, you try to describe an architecture style and it's always unique in senior housing because it's not, you want it to be as residential and homey as possible, but you can't compare a house to a senior housing property. So there's always <laughs> a little uniqueness to that. And then we just have some uh, renderings there of uh, what it will look like from the side. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Greg. Any further presentations? I have a few more for you. Okay. So a couple more slides. So. While you're calling those up, can I ask a question? Does this, does this uh, affect our arena numbers? This would not affect our arena numbers because there are no kitchens proposed in this assisted living facility. If there were beds and kitchens, then they would count towards arena numbers. So Peter, while we're waiting for Katie to follow, I have a question for the applicant. Have you done any preliminary traffic analysis, number of car trips per day at all? Nothing? No. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, um, one other part of this is um, the applicant, when you come in for a, com a um, community benefit application, you're required to give a description of your proposal and you're also allowed to bring forth um, the site plan and design, although not required. The applicant brought forth the site plan and design and um, was given the option to start preliminary design feedback. It was not required, but knowing that if this were to move forward as a community benefit project, it would give them adequate time to start working on the design. So they opted to move forward with that. We um, hired RRM Design to do the review of their project, and they gave us a great memo that has a lot of design feedback attached to it. I have that available if we want to go there, if you want to reference it tonight. I have some slides of the RRM had, had taken the elevations and pointed out a few changes that they would recommend. Um, it's really up to the Planning Commission on how, if you want to, I think it's most important that we get through the community benefit aspect of this discussion tonight. But if you'd also, when you're making comments and giving feedback, like to comment on the design, um, there was definitely items uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, one other thing of note is the current design doesn't quite fit with our allowance. It's at 53 feet, the maximum is 50, so that would have to be decreased in order to comply with our the, the allowed benefit. Um, and there's a few other things that don't quite comply in terms of there's one missing parking space, it doesn't have adequate bicycle parking, but those are all things that I did not want to add additional costs to this project until that we, um, for revisions and modifications to their design until we've gotten through the public benefit piece. So they're aware that there are items that will need to be addressed in an official application, but at this time they have preliminary design review comments from RRM and zoning comments from staff. And question about that 53 feet. So this is gonna go eventually go to the city council, right? And so if they chose to leave it at 53 and not cut it down to 50, it, we couldn't approve it, but the city council could override us, right? You know, I would need a legal determination on that because the code is specific in this zone to be at 50 feet, and I would need to check our variance allowances, I, if whether or not we prohibit variance. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking about the, the apartment buildings in Merlot and Geyer's, uh, you know, they're going. That's, that would be under a development, um, Agreement. Different so set of very rules. different because there's a whole different set of rules. Okay, thank you. So uh, with that, our recommendation tonight is to provide the applicant with feedback on annexation request and as to whether the request for incentives is worthy of consideration for co for the community benefit proposed, um, and then if there is general support for the community benefit, any design feedback would be welcomed. I also just want to point out in the staff recommendation, it's um, feedback on the annexation and whether or not the request for the incentive is worthy of consideration. It'd be good to get feedback on both if you, um, if it's one or the other or both. So I appreciate feedback. So, and with that, we'll. I can answer any questions. All right. Are there any other questions of uh, staff from the commissioners? Okay, then let's open this up to public comment. Uh, this is a chance for the members of the public to speak on this particular item. You have three minutes uh, per, uh, per voice, and uh, if you wanna come up to the podium to speak on this, um, that would be great. And we would, uh, there, is there a uh, sign-up sheet 
on the on the podium. We would like to generally we'd like to ha have you sign in so that uh, we, we can get your name in the minutes spelled properly. So, are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? I will. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I couldn't hear them a little bit in the back there, so I'll just sign one here. My name is Susan Steely, and I'm a resident on Bulb Avenue, 1475. And all these people here are from Bulb Avenue, so <laughs> they are coming to support me, and I'm not really good at this, and I don't have all the studies, but I have tried to address what these gentlemen have said to us. So I'm gonna read real quickly and not get off course here. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, does the proposed plan exemplify the s substantial benefit to the community? I question some of their figures, their facts are, 15% of the Capitola population is 65 years of age and older. That's me, and I'm from Santa Cruz. And that's 1,539 people, and they say they need this facility because they don't have enough. And what they didn't consider was the fact that a lot of these people have owned their homes, and they're going to do everything they can to stay in their home if they have to remedy, they have to add, make additions, add a ramp or whatever. And there are federal grants, and I know that the city of Capitola supports everybody improving their home so they can stay in their home. And so home ownership, 47.7% of people own their homes according to the 2020 census. Senior living in poverty is 70% according to the 2020 census. Seniors will do what they can to stay in their home. And this was an important fact that was just available to me. The number of seniors who live with their family, the oldest fashioned extended family in 2020 census, shows that 47% of that 1,539 people, which is 725, live with their families. Point not considered, which uh, their argument was just made that there's not enough facilities. Well, uh, different studies say there's between 18 and 29 within a nine mile radius of the Capitola area. And I have a chart, but I put the little dots where they are. And that includes a couple in Santa and Scotts Valley. And there's also the Westwood Memory Care Center, which was not mentioned, in downtown Santa Cruz. I'm not sure of the capacity on these. I don't have that research knowledge, but I know they exist. And also, at 3245, right across the street from the, this proposed facility, is an assist, assisted living facility, which one of our friends lives in. So the question, does this development meet the highest and best use for the community and is it a substantial benefit I kind of agree with the rest of our people we say no but I'll go on the uh, main you, need reason to, you need to finish up you, you have three minutes pardon your, me? Three, your three minutes is about up so if you could try okay, to then summarize I will go ahead Peter, to the Peter, I have a question are you representing all these people and you're the only one no, speaking? they all wrote letters but are you the only one speaking in this group? I don't know Okay. okay, I'll go fast. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going to go fast. Okay, the location is flawed because of the whole ingress and egress is on Bulb Avenue, which is totally unacceptable because of the street. The street has no sidewalks for people to get off the street in case of emergency vehicles, and uh, the street is narrow. There's parking, so it, the density factor is going to be major. So all in all, I'm going to go back to my po last point that the location is more f flawed than the facility. So there is taking up too much traffic density and bringing in uh, too many trucks and things into our area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am Marilyn McCallum White. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Marilyn McCallum White. I uh, built my house on 1484 Bulb Avenue when I was 27 years old. I've been there ever since. Uh, the entire time that I have lived there, 
They have never repaid Bulb, Bulb Avenue until just like um, last year. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I have a letter that I, I'm going to address for the traffic issue is what is uh, a, another big concern. Um, I'm the homeowner and resident at 1484 Bulb Avenue, and I have concerns with the proposed development. In the 45, well, it's not quite 45 years, but close, <laughs> I have lived here. I have watched as our street has become too small for the traffic that passes through. Most of the time, there isn't room for two cars to pass, so we must wait like a one-way street. Seeing as the proposed development calls for ingress and egress on Bulb Avenue, this is going to significantly impact the residents. Due to the median, it isn't possible to turn left on Capitola Road, which would direct traffic right down Bulb Avenue. And I want to make a note here of saying that we're going to have um, employees that are that would be working there. We're going to have people coming and visiting the residents. It's going to hugely impact the traffic flow down an already too small street. Uh, not to mention the fact that you know there's no school buses anymore. The little kids are walking to school. There are many, many kids that walk to school. Parents are all working. And that's an added danger to the children, I feel like, with more traffic. Uh, this could be remedied by, this could be remedied by blocking off Bulb Avenue just past the parking lot so there wouldn't be cars coming up and down our street. And we've done that before. There's other streets that are blocked off. I think that would be a reasonable accommodation. Bulb Avenue should not be affected by this project. Changing the property to the city of Capitola does not change the fact that this is a residential area that barely accommodates the residents that it currently houses. And I would have one more question too. I don't, I would guess I would like a clarification of how this project is going to help the coastal resources enhance. I don't, I don't see that, I don't understand that. So I'd like some clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. So before we have a, the next person come up, and you can co go ahead and come on up, but while you're, while you're doing that, I, I just want to acknowledge that we did receive many letters, okay. and we all had an opportunity to review those. Okay. So we appreciate your, your input, and we have had a chance to review them all. So. Then I don't need to say anything. No, no. Oh, no, please, no, go no, ahead. Yes, please. Okay, I'll yes. repeat what I, you guys probably already got. There were 10 okay. letters. <laughs> that were my husband and I have been there on Bulb Avenue since 1996, and he was there a little bit, few years before me. And we've been working for years and years just upgrading our house, upgrading our house, and always working on it. We finally got it pretty well nice and made. And so my idea of living there and retiring, because we're both just retired, um, I don't want to live across the street from a business. It's a residential. My other concern is there are way too many cars on that street, and no two cars can drive down that street. It's insane. And half the street, <coughs> most of the streets do not have sidewalks and gutters, so every winter we got <coughs> floods going down that street. So if you're going to have wheelchair people coming down, where are they going to go? And then we have dog walkers and a lot of people. So those are my big concern. I love the idea of a new um, assisted living. We need that. But I just don't want it on my residential street. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Vic Clauser. I live at 1360 Bulb Avenue. I've been there since 1986, so I beat you by 10 years. <laughs> um, as my neighbor was saying a lot of us have made improvements on our properties over the years, slowly fixing them up as we could afford it, beautifying our curb appeal as best we can. We're proud of it. And it's happening more and more on Bold. So we have a lot of investment of heart and money and hard work in our homes. Um, I know that people can take the approach of not in my backyard, but uh, I will tell you with, from personal experience, my mom and dad are 96 and 95 years old. They were, they're still living. Um, they were in ages for uh, almost a year. Uh, couldn't afford to keep them there. And I'll tell you that prices for a facility like this are not cheap. They're not, there are not many people in Santa Cruz County that 
can afford that. They're paying upwards of $12,000 a month there. They're doing so well, we had to move them out and think of something different. I'm applying for VA benefits for my dad, who's a World War II vet, and uh, hopefully that'll go through. That's a side note, but my question to you is that at what point would you consider annexing this property because of the tax base revenue that you would receive from it over the needs of our neighbors, of my neighbors here? The last gal who spoke is absolutely right when she says, if you look at the, the, the double line going down our street, it's crookeder than a dog's leg. It, you can't even, it's not straight because it's just all over the place and it's not wide enough and you can barely park, as she said, cars have to wait for each other to come by. We're already experiencing high volume of traffic coming from the mall. People want to avoid 41st Avenue, so Bulb Avenue is a shortcut to get down to Bromer and then over to 38th and wherever you want to go. So <clears throat> I just wanted to put that question to you directly to please hear our hearts on this. It's not that we're against, well, I'll speak for myself. It's not that I'm against this kind of housing because I know people need it. Uh, we were fortunate enough to move my parents into an apartment where as a family we can hire in-home care. It's a lot cheaper and we're saving them thousands of dollars a month. So um, I beg to differ with you <coughs> a little bit on, on the needs of this and I will tell you also, as this gentleman said, his grandmother would have liked to have passed in her own home. My parents too, they were so glad to get out of there because it was depressing for them to see people that were not doing well and deteriorating in front of them. Is that my time? Yep. Okay. Thank you for letting me speak. Last sentence or two, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Clouser. <laughs> we need volume control on that. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Rebecca Russell and I've lived at 1484 Bulb Avenue for my entire life. And um, I have watched it go from a you know, a tiny little residential street where I rode my bike and there was never any cars. And now it's just constant. There is constant traffic coming up and down the street. They're not, I mean, they're going so fast down our street because they're trying to take a break <laughs> from Capitola and Bromer. So they're trying to get where they're going as fast as they can. So that's been a big issue um, with the idea of how much traffic is going to come and go. That being said, um, I do want to make um, kind of a point with what Vic was saying about how I really don't have a problem with the senior living facility being put. I mean, I, it is a huge need in our, um, in our area for affordable housing for seniors. And I don't know where the, no I would like to see the sources of the numbers of seniors going up um, at 50,000 plus a year because um, the seniors that I know that are on fixed incomes through Social Security are pulling maybe 30 per year. I would also like to see how much per month they are charging the residents um, to stay there to prove to us that, that it, this is something that our community can actually benefit from. Because from where I'm standing, it sounds like um, they're trying to get the highest earners in this luxury senior housing development, which is what they called it, um, into a small neighborhood. So that's what I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Anyone else? I didn't really come prepared to speak, but I did send um, an email. But as I sat here, I felt like I really needed our voice to, to be heard in the sense that obviously we're a very tight neighborhood. I mean, we have grown established re uh, relationships. We're, we, we, we're a really solid community. And when the more and more I looked at the plans, I just was becoming more and more concerned about how this facility is not really impacting Capitola. We are the ones as residents being affected. There's not an entrance to this facility in Capitola. It would be the 1610 property, which is residential, that would be the entrance to this facility. To me, that's wrong to even think that it's right to consider a residential place and turn it into a commercial. So 
I really would like them to think if you're wanting to have something, have it on the Capitola area. That's great. We're Ponos is. That's great. Entrance. Why are you taking a residential street that's highly impacted? We have so many families. My boys are out playing basketball all the time. But they're right. The line doesn't even go straight down our street. It's crooked up by where the top of the facility is. Obviously, they had no idea. They walked around and they put mailers in our mailboxes. They didn't even use the postal system to send out flyers about this new development that they have. So I just think it's a lack of respect for our community. And I feel like our voices need to be heard because it's really going to impact us on Gold Avenue, the residents. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Scott Lawrence, and I live at 1574 Bold Avenue, which is directly next door to 1610. So this will have the largest impact on my property. I bought my house 26 years ago. Pono was a house. Now it's a business. I have to deal with people playing ball in their, in their parking lot and coming to my yard to get their Frisbees and their baseballs when they come over the fence. I have to deal with people sitting in their cars listening to loud music. And now you wanna, they want to annex this last residential buffer that I have and turn it into a parking lot right next door to my house. It's not right. I'm not against the, the use of the property. I'm against the size of the property. And I'm against the impact of the traffic that's going to be on our street. Every time something, a new project is built, it impacts my property. And now this thing is huge. And it's the last residential buffer I have to commercial property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. And please remember to sign in when you come up to speak for the record. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. My name is Donna Jensen Lewis. I live at 1472 Bulb Avenue. And my concern is primarily with emergency vehicle traffic up and down our very narrow street where we have lots of kids and animals out. Um, I can only imagine with senior living facility that there is going to be lots of emergency vehicle traffic coming and going. Um, we, I just can't even imagine what that would be like on our tiny little street where we are saying that our cars can't even pass each other, much less emergency vehicles. Um, it also, I think really detracts from um, what's already been mentioned about our residential community that we have established. And when I look at the criteria for the community benefit, I am having a really hard time seeing how this meets any one of these five criteria. Um, when it was being read, uh, in my mind, I just don't see the connection there where it's meeting these criteria. So. Those are my primary concerns. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Hi, my name's Christina Shear. I am a resident of Santa Cruz County. I'm not a resident of Capitola, but I've lived in the county since 1973. And when I sit here this evening and I hear of a project, I guess you'd say a permit that could be issued because it's a c for the community betterment, I think to myself, is this like things that have been occurring in Santa Cruz County? Instead of people applying for a commercial permit, the application is for commercial for this type of facility. If these people apply under the category of community betterment, does that give them a tax break? And I, it seems as though they should be applying for a straight commercial application. That's all I want to say because I feel that there has, I looked into the ownership of these properties and where the people are. There's a Delaware Corporation, a lot of other things going on. And I really feel 
that the Planning Commission should further investigate what the tax incentives for this group is that wants to build projects. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shear. Is there anyone else wishing to come up and speak on this issue? Doug Balby, I'm at 1447 Bulb Avenue. And aside from pointing out the, the substandard width of Bulb Avenue and the fact that you, you really can't drive that street without crossing over the double yellow line already, it's, it's not just the width, it's also the intersection at Capitola Road where the sight distance is substandard. And so you, you can't, especially because of the AT&T building there, you really can't see very far down and that makes it pretty dangerous pulling out onto Capitola Road. And I wanna point out that um, that as an uh, increasing traffic on that is not a good thing um, because of that issue. Thanks. Thank you. Well, the next person's coming up. Katie, do we have jurisdiction over Bulb Avenue? Uh, it's county road, isn't it? It, it is in the county. So any, any just for the audience's benefit, any comments uh, that you have about the quality of the road, you need to go to the county. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, um, my name is um, Michael Price. Uh, um, I wrote a, a, a letter, so so um, I won't repeat it here. Um, I'm more. Um, uh, uh, I live at a one four seven nine. Bob, so I'm more here to speak on behalf of, of my two-year-old daughter, Gwen. Believe it or not, she's asleep, and, and, and she can make it tonight. So <laughs> um, 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 we've been um, on Bob for two and a half years, so, so probably one, like one of the newer <laughs> residents, um, and we, we feel like w w we struck the lottery here by, by, like, um, you know, by finding s s such a, like a quiet and safe and welcoming uh, neighborhood. Uh, um, the the tra traffic is one of my ma main concerns. Um, traffic, noise, property uh, value uh, over time. You know, like w w with a big commercial complex there. Um, but but most importantly, safety. You know, my daughter like loves to go and like play um, like in the street with our you know, uh, neighbors. Um, um, it's uh, uh, um, <laughs> the uh, are very crooked street as windy um, as it is uh, um, <laughs> is, is still a s somewhat quiet place most of the time um, with the amount of of, of, of workers at this new place um, <laughs> ambulances d d d um <laughs> deliveries you know um, that would be be an exponential in increase of traffic flow and yeah so I'm just going to repeat what everyone else has said and what you've already heard so thank you Thank you. Hi, my name is Jason Wagner Marsh, and I live at 1366 Bulb Avenue. And uh, I've lived there since uh, 2019. And uh, just like he was saying, I also have uh, young children. I have a 17 year old, uh, 17 month old son, and a three and a half year old daughter. And every day, we take them on walks up and down the street. My daughter's starting to ride the bike. And my main concern is, you know, there's going to be more traffic. There's no sidewalk going down a lot of the street. So for me, it's a big concern having more cars coming up and down the street, <laughs> not a place for the kids to get off the street and uh, be safe. So, so, yeah, that's my main concern. Thank you, Mr. Wagamarsh. Thank you. Anyone else? We do have uh, two hands raised in Zoom. So, Chloe, are you able to uh, unmute? unmute? Sure. Is that, all, is that all right, Chair? Okay. Mm -hmm. Rich, I'm going to allow you to speak. Go ahead. You just have to unmute. Hey. There we Hello. Go. Uh, my, na my name is uh, Rich Owis, and I live just behind this facility on Terra Court. Uh, this is the first I've seen of this uh, proposal. And I'm uh, 
a little concerned about the front design. If it's a memory, memory care facility and there are people that are allowed to go out or visit uh, with their relatives in front, it seemed like there's an opportunity for one of these people to walk away and uh, roam the neighborhood, which I'm within that block area of the neighborhood. But more importantly, at the back of the facility is where the emergency vehicles will come in with their sirens blasting because unfortunately these type of facilities have a lot of visits from emergency vehicles. And so we're going to be hearing uh, lots of sirens coming in off the bulb into the back of this facility where they should be coming in from the front where uh, you have a shopping center across the street and the noise wouldn't be such an issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have uh, Jennifer. I'm going to allow you to speak. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Jennifer Gallagher. I am at 1505 Bulb Avenue, where I have been with my family for the past decade. My first concern is over the annexation in general and just the inequity that my neighbor Angie spoke about. I am a resident of Live Oak. I cannot vote on the Capitola City Council, where if this moves forward, the planning department and others will be having that power to move or deny these everything to do with this project so a project that would affect me and my neighbors so greatly we have no power or no voice over as live oak residents so i'm very much opposed to the annexation in general and then beyond that when i look at the presentation slides that were presented today around the community benefits the first one was that local residents would stay in the community which I also really have a hard time believing based on the price point of this development. Um, the second is the payroll and property tax, which does not seem to meet the standards of number 11. And the third was the sales tax and tourism revenue noted for visiting family members, which seems like very much a direct um, contradiction to being told that we would not have traffic or parking impacts or a lot of people coming and going if one of their community benefits is supposed to be tourism res revenue. So I just want to really strongly voice my opposition to this project moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallagher. One more. So I'm going to mute Jennifer. Okay. Teresa, I'm going to allow you to speak. Is that me? Yep. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I'm 1650 Bulb Avenue. Actually, I've been here since 1977. Teresa, so. can we get your full name? Teresa Stola. Thank you. Um, I have been here since there were cows for the capital of Mollison. I would like to voice, um, please don't make this annexation happen, because it's the last demarcation of a residential line on our street versus the commercial if you don't annex then what is put in the place where the capital of the kennels is actually has to conform more to the size and would be marketing for our neighborhood um clearly all the parking and driving issues have been stated and that's a big concern noise is a big concern size is a huge concern how much is that going to block our light and our trees and change the whole environment of our street. So I'm so happy our neighborhood has come out together to really voice our concerns and we really, really hope you consider not annexing 1610 and keeping that residential. Thank you, Ms. Falwell. Is that it? I don't, I don't see any more hands. Thank you. Any more members of the public? Last chance before we bring it back to the commission. Okay. Uh, we've had our public comment. Now it's time for planning commission deliberation. Anybody want to start? Go, Mick. You want me to start? Go, Mick. Yeah. Go. <laughs> 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 
when the whole idea of community benefit came up several years ago at the time the zoning ordinance was being adopted, and I believe it was put into the general plan, I objected to it at that time. I still object to it because I think it's an end run around our zoning regulations, and it's so subjective that it just depends on who's in power to determine whether there's a community benefit or not. So I'm a hard sell on the community benefit. And if you could, if you could put the criteria up for uh, recognizing a community benefit, I'm going to want to see that too. Hmm. Come on. There we go. <coughs> yeah, I I was struck by by number 2 and number 4. Uh, I'll be honest. I've lived in Capitola for 60 years. I've never driven down Bulb. And I never have because it's such a substandard street. It just doesn't <laughs> look like you should drive down it. Uh, so I have a really difficult time with that criteria that there's infrastructure to accommodate. And I also have a difficult time with number four, uh, minimizing adverse impacts to the neighboring properties. So. It's going to take a lot of convincing to me to make those two findings to give a community benefit here. Uh, someone mentioned blocking off bulb to stop the traffic from coming down it on that uh, one side from Capitola Road. But that's such an inconvenience for the neighbors. If, if you guys want to access anything near 41st, you have to go all the way out and around to get there. So I don't, I don't think that's a, that's a real solution. Someone else mentioned the number of emergency benefits, or not emergency benefits, I'm sorry, emergency vehicles that may occur. I don't know if any of you have the Pulse Point app on your phones or iPads, but if you look at the Pulse Point app on a regular basis, and I live somewhat near Pacific Coast Manor on Wharf Road, the number of calls they have at that facility, and that's an assisted living facility, and it's all a rehab facility. It's incredible, the number of, number of places they have there. So I think that would have to be something that would possibly be addressed uh, for the ingress and egress if this were to be approved. Uh, what else do I have here? Oh, in our, I think in our general plan, <coughs> one, of the, one of the statements in there one of the guiding principles is to protect the integrity of our neighborhoods. And even though this neighborhood isn't in the city, it's in our sphere of influence. And those two things, this project and that statement seem to be incongruent to me. So I'm having a difficult time. I mean, it's gonna take some real convincing to me to support the annexation and because uh, the city has to be the lead agency on that, I believe. The applicant can be the lead. They can? Mm -hmm. Okay. But they need the city's, um, a letter of recommendation from yeah. the city council. Our stamp of approval. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I'd have to have some serious convincing to move forward with this in its current configuration. Thank you. Uh, quick question, Katie. The annexation, if it was annexed, it would be annexed commercial and currently it's residential. Is that how that works that's correct so you could not have a, a a large parking lot on a residential site so therefore the only way to make it work under the current configuration would be to annex and very good it'd be commercial i had a quick question for staff sure. um in the applicants he was he was saying that the fourth floor was to compensate for dedicating the um the the rear lot for parking if if the annexation wasn't an option. He was saying that there would be two. Is is what, what would be the other option? I don't understand how it would the, the trade off. So um, if it was not annexed, it would have to. It could only be developed under the county code as right. it stands today. Okay. So I think you made a reference to. Um, I think the the point that 
the architect was making was that if it were annexed <coughs> and became commercial, they could do a three-story building on that lot. Mm -hmm. And so they're asking for the fourth story on the front lot in, in order to not put any structures on the rear lot. Okay. Thank you. Gotcha. Susan? My turn. Um, well, as usual, I agree and disagree with some of Commissioner <laughs> Root's comments. Um, I think the community benefit has to be a uh, real benefit to the community. And um, while, uh, because um, in my other life, one of the things I do is I'm a hospice volunteer. So I go to all of these facilities weekly. And I know there is a huge, huge need in Santa Cruz County for more assisted living locations, more memory facilities. But I also know that that need uh, is not just for more facilities, but facilities that are affordable for the seniors in our community who need them. So if I was going to <coughs> consider something like a community benefit, someone would be saying to me that they were going to make a certain portion of this affordable, they might even be saying that a certain portion of this was going to have kitchens in the room, which would help us with our arena numbers. Um, they uh, would come up with a design um, that was, uh, you know, compatible for the area that it was going to go in. Uh, we um, now, I think a couple of years ago, looked at a project to redo the Capitola Mall. And one of the items that they proposed was having residential uh, that I believe was four, maybe even five story that abutted Capitola Road. And uh, when that project came in, the community clearly indicated that <coughs> having something that size abut Capitola Road was not appropriate, that we would need to have designs where the building was stepped back, um, that there was some um, public access in the front of it. So um, while I'm not completely opposed to the idea of changing some of our regulations for community benefit, for me, this project hasn't gotten to the point where I could say, yes, I think there is a community benefit. I mean, there would have to be some um, you know, changes in how it's set up, managed, operated, as well as, as the design of the project. Um, I have great empathy for the people who live on Bulb, because uh, I do agree with Commissioner Ruth, until this project came up, I don't think I've ever driven down Bulb, because it's just not one that you look at as, as a shortcut street. Um, uh, it, would, it would be imperative for this project to, you know, figure out how to deal with, um, you know, the traffic and the emergency vehicles coming in and out. Uh, to date, we really don't have any information on how all of that's going to work. So um, uh, to, to sum it up, uh, as far as community benefit, there needs to be some changes. Um, I, I don't think the the size of the facility and the way it's being uh, approached right now with just parking in the back and a big four-story building uh, coming up to the sidewalk on both Capitola Road and Bulb Avenue works for me. Um, I have a little different opinion on the annexation. I think for the city to annex that property would be a good thing for the city of Capitola. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm here representing Capitola, so you know, I, I, I want to be sensitive to what you need, but also what the city of Capitola needs, because I think um, this site is ultimately going to be developed. And some of you were here when we talked about state laws and housing and density earlier this evening. Uh, it is going to be possible under the new state laws for someone to come in and put a three or four story apartment building on that site. And so I think having a little larger site that people can work with ultimately would benefit Capitola and also ultimately benefit the people who live on Bulb 
so we could have a design that, that would work for all of us. Um, so those are my comments at this time. Thank you. Courtney? Um, I, I very much agree with Commissioner Westman. Um, I think annexation would benefit Capitola, um, and I do agree that there could be a, a very large building put on that, um, on that lot. I, I think my overall impression with the entire building design is, is really most what impacts me, is that I don't think that the community is gonna benefit from a four-story building. Um, and there isn't enough information provided for traffic and um, ingress and egress to really understand how it's going to affect the neighbors. Um, I would, I would, mm, I just think more articulation where um, the mall was concerned, it's very similar how it, how it affects the overall streetscape. Um, I think it just, just more, more a second, a second pass at it with more information. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Katie, can, can we look at that other slide that showed uh, the reasons that we would give uh, uh, a waiver? Oh, that was... No, well, it was, but no, but it had to do with the public, uh, you had a list that had all the things like public oh. parks or, you know. They, they allowed benefits. They allowed benefits. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's the one. Okay, so that's how I looked at this. I said, well, what they're asking for is a waiver or a, or a, a variance to the code. So he says, well, what, you know, I've got no objection to creating a assisted living facility or, you know, any, any business as long as it meets code. And so I say, well, all right, what are the reasons for allowing a variance? Well, okay, so the general plan and, uh, and the, the code is, is pretty clear on the kinds of things that we should consider. And uh, boy, I'm looking at this list and, and it do this, uh, the, uh, this doesn't seem to fit at all. I mean, something that, you know, really invigorates 41st Street, gives us better transportation, uh, more green building, public par public uh, parking. Uh, to me, it's um, I, I was struggling to see where this would fit. And other community benefits to to Commissioner uh, Ruth's point, it's like, well, that's kind of a catch-all. And so I wanted to say, well, in in the light of items one through ten, does this kind of fit in that spirit? And I just didn't see it. So. Um, my attitude was that is that I, I don't feel that I have justification for allowing a variance, irregardless of w how I love the design or, um, you know, if it even if it uh, you know the, everybody in the audience loved this, it's like, uh, but <laughs> I don't I don't think it meets the criteria for a variance, just as as a bureaucrat. Um, with regards to um, the annexation, I was impressed with Mr. Lawrence and felt that that the people of the uh, county are, it's like taxation without representation. We're gonna come in here and, and change the code and make something commercial where it was been residential. And now all of a sudden we're like the bully coming in and saying, no, no, we're gonna annex this and you know, to heck with you guys, we're gonna have this four story building bearing down on you. And sorry, you're not part of Capitola, so tough luck. So I, I don't like that aspect of it either. So I'd be against the annexation. Um, so I don't know, to, to, uh, what else do we need to do here? Those are kind of my comments. Is that, do we need a vote on something? No, or there's uh, no vote. This is uh, just non-binding information that you've given me. Can we take me. a vote? Uh, no. <laughs> well, I, I, well it, yeah, this I, I think I'd from like a- I'd like to have the Planning Commission go on record with a vote that it doesn't meet the criteria for community benefit. Um. I, I, I'll pull up this slide, but pursuant to the code, and we really need to follow the code, um, the conceptual review provides the applicant with non-binding input from the City Council and Planning Commission as to whether the request for incentive is worthy for consideration. I'm hearing a bit of a split, a 2-2 two -two split on the whether or not this is worthy for consideration. It sounds like 
it hasn't really met anyone's bar at this point that additional work would need, need to be done and additional information. But I've, I've now created a list of all of your comments. All of your comments will go forward to the City Council as a recommendation. And the City Council will be meeting next week on Thursday at 7 o'clock um, and hearing this item. I will include in the packet all additional item, all additional um, letters that were included. I've got 10 new letters that came in today and the additional information from the applicant. So all of that will be in the packet published tomorrow along with the summary of the city, uh, the planning commission's direction on this or feedback. So. Um, yeah, and, and my comment again to the audience at large is that uh, my experience with the City Council is that they were very good about reading all the inputs and all the letters. So um, so all your, your all your inputs will be appreciated. It doesn't hurt to be there, though. No, definitely be there. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they listen to the commission. <laughs> all right. Um, is there anything else on this item? Okay. So we'll move on then to, um, where are we? Commission, done. commission com director's report. Uh, I look forward to the November 3rd <laughs> meeting. I have no new information for you this evening. All right, and uh, with that, are there final uh, uh, commission co communications of any kind? Any last minute announcements or discussions? Okay, this meeting is adjourned. I'm going to end the Zoom. Goodbye. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. And farewell. Goodbye. Farewell to you as well. Goodbye. And here's your address. I took three most of you. I took three too. Thank you. The cost of these places has gotten to be ridiculous.